Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah, I I feel like Zainab, you kind of hinted at some of this. Um, change happens. Um, it doesn't, yeah, you know, the time doesn't stop. Things change. So what we're going to talk about in the next 10, 15 minutes is where OpenMRS started, um, different OpenMRS initiatives around the year, around the world, and how OpenMRS has evolved. Um, and then as we do that, as we look at where we came from and how we've changed, we're going to talk about the different patient conditions and program areas that OpenMRS has served over time and how that has come to be. Um, but before we dive into all of that, we hear a lot of different things about OpenMRS, um, and, and Zainab mentioned a few of them. Um, so what I want to do is hear from you. Um, we're going to use Menti again, that fantastic Menti meter. It's the same code, but we want to hear who do you think uses OpenMRS? What patient conditions and programs does OpenMRS support? And what facilities use OpenMRS? So it's the same Menti link. Um, you should see this question up on your slide. Go ahead and just share a few, a few of your your thoughts and your answers. Um, tell us, tell us what you know, what you're seeing around you, what you're hearing from other people about who uses OpenMRS, what patient conditions and programs OpenMRS supports. So you can just use that same Menti link. Or you can go to menti.com and use that code at the top. Um, so people are saying it's primarily used in low to middle income countries where healthcare resources are limited. It's used in healthcare facilities. What kinds of healthcare facilities? It is mostly used by medical professionals and patients as well. Okay, so we're getting into who uses OpenMRS. Healthcare facilities and LMICs, yep. Nurses, nurses use OpenMRS. We know that nurses are, you know, the backbone, the spine of our healthcare systems. Um, clinicians and healthcare providers use OpenMRS. Um, I'm just gonna look at who you, medical staff. Um, and then let's talk about different facilities. We hear clinicians, uh, Future-driven e-hospitals with limited resources that provide even better workflows can use OpenMRS. Um, people are saying healthcare centers, hospitals, um, health service clusters, um, HIV AIDS. They can be used, somebody's saying OpenMRS can be used in any setting for all health programs, regardless whether the facility is a primary health facility or inpatient facilities. Um, so it can be used for all kinds of specialties, all, all conditions because of the use of standards, hospital, and it can be used for hospital and primary health care facilities. Data clerks, uh, health care providers, people are saying that it can be used for HIV, ANC, COVID, um, tuberculosis. It can be used in government institutions, in low-income medical centers, in clinics. Um, we're hearing a lot of different ways that, you know, a lot of different users, mainly at health facilities who are using OpenMRS um, and for a lot of different patient conditions and programs um, in, in a lot of different types of facilities. Fantastic. Well, how did we get here? Um, that's what that's what I want to I want to dive into a little bit now. Um, we've we've heard you know Zainab mentioned what is global goods and OpenMRS is a recognized digital global good. You can find us in the Global Goods Guidebook or on the Digital Public Goods um, Registry, and and that's because it is not only a robust, scalable, user driven open source EMR system, it's because we're also a global community um, of talented and dedicated contributors, both individuals and organizations. So these designations really come because OpenMRS has become 
a strong EMR system, an open source system, and a strong community. Um, so from the beginning, I want to talk about our values a little bit. Our, our values are what have driven us forward. Um, and from the beginning, addressing the real needs of users has been one of our guiding principles. So when we think about how OpenMRS was designed and built out in the open in a modular way from the very beginning, this means that anybody can reuse and customize OpenMRS to meet the needs of any health service and program area. So that's great um, because it doesn't limit where OpenMRS can be used or what programs or users can use OpenMRS. But that also means that at the beginning, there was a pretty big challenge. Building an EMR system is a significant undertaking. Where do you even start? So I want to roll the clock back a little bit. Let's go back about 20 years and take a look at where OpenMRS started and how we began building out this EMR system. So think back to 2004, if you can. Um, this is when su Sub-Saharan Africa was seeing 2.3 million adult and child deaths due to HIV AIDS. And fighting the HIV epidemic, increasing access to treatment was a high priority for many countries, for many healthcare providers, and aid agencies. So let's think about it some more. In 2004, PEPFAR was barely a year old. And in 2004, OpenMRS started with a single clinic in Eldoret, Kenya. The main health issue of the day gave us our first significant use case um, to try to start building out OpenMRS as, you, as we know it. And that use case was HIV AIDS. Now, in 2004, we also know that the majority of health record staff at health facilities were responsible for managing paper records. And so those health record staff, those health record officers and data clerks, they became our first target user. So whether it was country leadership or program leadership, healthcare providers, developers, everybody was eager to build and use OpenMRS to give quality healthcare treatment to people living with HIV and get the epidemic under control. And since our community values being user-driven, we started with this first use case and this first target user in mind, knowing that other use cases and other target users would rapidly follow. So this meant making decisions about our technology and our design that would allow developers to reuse OpenMRS for other patient conditions and other users as time went on. And time passes, right? So over the next two to three years, South Africa and Rwanda began using OpenMRS to achieve their goals for controlling the HIV epidemic. And we started seeing significant investments from PEPFAR, leading to an increased number of OpenMRS country implementations that focused on adapting OpenMRS to help curb, once again, the HIV epidemic and monitor progress towards those important goals like 95, 95, 95, where I remember there was a lot of talk in 2016, 2017, 2018 about 95, 95, 95. And by that time, OpenMRS was being used in 17 countries serving 5 million patients who were going and receiving care at over 1,100 health facilities. So when we start to look country by country, implementation by implementation, it's really easy to see how OpenMRS has become known for its use in HIV clinics. But as expected, this was changing. OpenMRS was being used for more than HIV programs and retrospective data entry. Other funders and aid agencies were investing in new features and functionality that supported a broader range of health services and point of care. And the ref reference application the second iteration of OpenMRS, which was already a, a key component of PIH's EMR, was on the way to becoming the backbone of many other country-specific OpenMRS distributions, um, including Kenya EMR, Uganda EMR, and Nigeria, Nigeria MRS. So what we saw happening was as early as 2013, organizations like Partners in Health, PIH, were working with the OpenMRS community to update and expand OpenMRS for that broader use. 
across health facilities like Hades University Hospital in Mirabalay, which is a teaching hospital with 320 beds. And providers were on their way to using OpenMRS at point of care now to support primary care, maternal health, NCDs, surgery, oncology, emergency direct services, pharmacy, and radiology. And then during 2015, in the Ebola, with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, OpenMRS was also adapted to support that intensive clinical care at Ebola treatment centers. Meanwhile, back in Eldoret, where OpenMRS first started, Ampath was creating a custom version of OpenMRS that was also being used at point of care, and their experience is informing our current focus. So here we are, 20 years later, and OpenMRS is now being used at more than 8,000 health facilities in over 40 countries and managing the health records for more than 16.6 million patients. And these are not only HIV AIDS patients or people living with HIV AIDS, these are people coming for primary health care, for maternal and child health, for a broad range of patient conditions. And since then, we have seen the number of deaths due to AIDS falling dramatically, um, even as the number of people living with HIV and who need that whole person care remains about the same. We've also lived through the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of things have changed over the last 20 years. And country priorities are continuing to change. And what countries wanted from an e for, want from an EMR system today is different than what implementations prioritized almost 20 years ago. Increasingly, we see that governments are looking for an interoperable open source EMR system that can be used hospital-wide for all kinds of health services and programs and fits within their vision for a comprehensive health information system. And clearly, OpenMRS has been changing. It's not your grandpa's OpenMRS anymore. Um, in just a few minutes, I'm going to hand the, the stage over, the mic over to Grace Potma, our director of product, to talk more about um, today's OpenMRS. But today, we are actually working on the next generation of OpenMRS what we're calling OpenMRS 3 or O3, because just like time passes and change happens on the ground, technology changes. Um, and O3 now uses modern technology and a user interface design that is specifically intended for use at point of care. And this new technology is actually allowing greater collaboration among our community. We have more organizations sharing features easily so that other, another implementation can reuse and configure a feature de developed in another country setting. And when accompanied by financial investments, this means that organizations who are working alongside our community are in an ideal position to respond to these growing demand from users for newer features, for more comprehensive features, and drive OpenMRS into the future. So as you can see here, we're seeing a number of organizations, a growing number of organizations collaborating together within the community. And this is because we foster an environment where organizations and individuals are encouraged to openly share and collaboratively improve the wide range of features that countries are asking for and that implementers know their implementations need. And our community has been changing alongside, the, alongside our technology. Um, we've been making changes to our community that accommodates this growth and creates new opportunities for leadership and collaboration while still remaining true to our open source values that we know work. What we know works is being user driven, being open, and being transparent. We also know that alignment is one of the secrets to our success, as long as we're not overly prescriptive and allow teams the right amount of autonomy to get things done. This hasn't been easy. Um, collaboration is harder than it, it seems. And what worked well in the beginning had to change as we grew. So in the past, we had a very simple community structure that provided great alignment around our platform and our reference application. It worked really well when we were a small community, but we've been growing a lot. And now our technology and our, our environment needed to change so that we wouldn't have to be limited 
um, in our innovation and people could rapidly get stuff done. Um, the implementations were prioritizing. So what we did is revised or updated our community model so that it consists of different squads and teams that are engaged with implementers and have community support. And each squad or team now works together to solve a particular problem and keep collaboration happening in a very coordinated way. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow in our community session. And then these squads are actually supported by an OpenMRS global support team um, that is actually spread out throughout the world. Um, this is another thing that we often hear is that OpenMRS is, is supported by people who live in the global north. Well, today, most of our team is actually located in the same time zones as the majority of our community members and the majority of our of OpenMRS implementations, whether this is in Sri Lanka or Uganda or Kenya or Poland. So this really makes a huge difference when it comes to being able to support people who want to grow OpenMRS and, um, and actually share features and, and really benefit from um, an open source community. I want to dive more into all of this, but I know that we have um, more to dive into around the product side and we'll have time on Wednesday and on Thursday to really dive more into how our community works and how you can get engaged and inform where, where OpenMRS is going. So with that, I'm going to hand things back to Joshua. Thank you.